and assalamu alaikum so my name is wahid and uh, i am basically from chitral where this research is also based uh, thank you so much to the organizers and uh, qaid azam university for bringing us together to discuss this really important issue of climate change uh, <clears throat> what i'm going to present is um, a bit different from what we have seen before uh, the reason is uh, my field of study is human geography uh, so there would be a lot of field work um, and, and qualitative research involved in this, uh, in this research. But I hope uh, it would be helpful in some way uh, for, our, for our seminar here today. So um, as introduced, uh, the topic of my research is how the pastoral livelihood of uh, people is changing in Chitral and how neoliberalism and climate change are affecting this change. Today, um, The outline of my presentation is first I would start with the abstract and then we'll talk a little about the background uh, of the study and then I'll talk about the theoretical framework that I used which is the rural political ecology uh, and then we will give you some background about what is pastoralism in Chitral and then I'll talk about uh, how it's transitioning from pastoral to neoliberal system and then finally coming to what we are discussing here is the climate change and pastoral livelihood and then we'll end with some discussions and conclusion. So the abstract, um, I think most of you have already read it from, uh, from the booklet that has been given to you. Uh, it's here again. But basically this paper focuses on the pastoral livelihood of people in Yarkhun Chitral and how it's changing towards a neoliberal lifestyle through engagement with rural and global politics and the diversity of discourses that describe and motivate such change using the lens of rural political ecology and the method of ethnographic discourse analysis. Through different examples of the challenges that pastoralists face, the author introduces the idea of rural political ecology that is distinct from urban political ecology as a lens to look at climate change and social natural phenomena of rural areas. So this paper basically presents a local perspective of the issue of climate change and the changing pastoral livelihood due to the role of NGOs and government initiatives uh, and future intervention by the government and other organizations in rural areas like Chitral must learn from this paper that any new project regarding climate change and development must be seen from a local perspective before implementation. This is extremely important because we are here today from the platform of the government and EPA and I really hope that we have some learnings from, from the field and from local people and from the indigenous knowledge. Just to give you a background, um, I'm sure people who are here in Pakistan must have heard of Chitral, but all, all of those who are joining from abroad, Chitral is basically in the extreme north of Pakistan. Uh, it's in the province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, and it uh, shares borders with uh, Afghan provinces, and then it also shares borders with Gilgit Baltistan and Sawat and Deer. Uh, Chitral was the largest district of KPK until 2018 when it uh, got split into two provinces. Now we have Upper Chitral and Lower Chitral. Uh, and uh, my field site, which is Yarkhun area, it's in the Mastuj district, which is very close to uh, Wakhan border. Next, uh, just to give you a background, I'm sure like people who are here um, are associated from to different kind of jobs and markets. So people in Chitral and northern areas have been long associated with pastoralism. Pastoralism, basically they have their cattle and their livelihood depends around these cattle, which include cows, goats, sheep, etc. Uh, and there used to be pastoralism much um, in, a, in a much greater quantity uh, when we were growing up, but it's shifting now, and we are going to talk about that shift today. Uh, the reason livestock and pastoralism is very important for this region is because the food and nutrition, their dress, their valuable asset in time of need, uh, their livestock is also used as a gift for mutual exchange, for communal rituals, for labor, for transport. It's, uh, it's a sign of social status. So you can see the whole livelihood actually revolves around pastoralism. That's why I have chosen this topic and that's why people there call malhal. Malhal, which uh, in the local language means that actually your livestock is your wealth. How you are known is through your livestock. Uh, to, talk to, uh, to tell you more about the uh, transition story, this is, um, this is a story from my field when I was there. 
it's, it's a very Khoar joke. It's a very Khoar centric. Khoar is the language that's spoken there. So I've tried to translate it. It might be a bit hard uh, for some of the people to understand, but I'm going to go ahead with this anyway, and I hope that you get this. So it was the 2nd of July, and we were sitting in a cousin's house in my village, Meragram, playing carom board with when Dean and Gul, these are two guys, uh, they asked in a very serious tone. So Dean asked Gul, so when are you taking your mal? Mal is basically cattle. To Ghari, Ghari is the high pasture. We were all surprised because everyone knew that Gul did not have any goats or bullocks left. And he replied that he does not know because he does not have any mal. So Dean replied, oh, come on. I heard that you are taking your pandau. Pandau is like basically broiler chicken that comes from outside for the free gazing of bullocks in, um, in, in summer. So everyone burst into laughter because there was never a scene in our village when a family would not take their cattle to the high pastures. So that is the, the story of transition that some families do not even have any cattle left in that part of the region. Now I'm going to talk a little about the theoretical framework that I use. And I hope people, especially students who are sitting here today, uh, uh, I, would, I would require your attention because this is something that's, um, that's quite new. And I would like people, from, especially from the rural areas, um, to apply this theory in many other things that we study. So political ecology, um, just to give you a brief overview, that was, uh, that was basically introduced by Blake and Brockfield in 1987. Uh, and it deals with basically um, ecology and a broadly defined political economy. So it's a mix of ecology and political economy. But there has been a shift in political ecology. It started with rural areas, but then it got totally shifted to urban areas. So now, if you look at political ecology everywhere, it would only talk about urban areas like Karachi, like Islamabad, like Peshawar. It wouldn't talk about places like Chitral or Gilgit Baldistan or Balochistan and other places around the world. So that's why I have suggested that we introduce the idea of rural political ecology, uh, which is not a simple and single frame of study, rather rural as a process of making and unmaking with continuous exposure to development, climate change, and neoliberalism. Um, I, think, uh, I think this is a quite a self-explanatory slide, uh, and I hope you got what maldarai or pastoralism mean in that part of the world. So I'm going to skip that. And then the next slide talks about the neoliberal economy, because the reason we are talking about neoliberal economy is because climate change and neoliberal economy are very well connected. Um, and wh why is this shift happening? Is because, <coughs> um, basically, I mean, for those who don't have any background in, new, in, in social sciences, uh, Harvey 20, 20, 2007 defined neoliberalism as the doctrine that market exchange is an ethic in itself, capable of acting as a guide for all, human and action. So basically, everything revolves around this kind of economy, and the state is the sovereign in this system. So that is the new system that is kind of has a wave throughout the world, and it has also reached Chitral, and that is affecting um, the, the pastoralist economy and the pastoralist system in, in the region. To give you some of um, the insights, how, how it is shifting, uh, let me quote one of my, my respondent uh, when I was interviewing them. So the person says, my wife says that we should quit keeping mal. Mal is basically cattle. I say that if you do not have any mal, and God forbid someone dies in your family, would you cry for the deceased loved one or go out searching for a sheep for a Khodai ritual? Basically, there is a ritual of Khodai where you have to basically butcher a sheep. And if you don't have that in your house, the person is saying, would you cry for your loved one or would you go out searching for mal? So that is how the transition is happening. Um, the major reason for this transition I have that I point out in my research is school education and NGOization of Yarhun. And basically they look down at pastoralists as backward, underdeveloped, um, and then there is no material on pastoralism in education system. So the education system that we see anywhere is basically something that's coming from Islamabad or Peshawar to this region that has no connection with the local community and their livelihood. So that is really affecting how people see their own lives, how they see what the, what the way they are living is not the American dream that that's taught to them in school. So that's a major reason. Now coming to 
the most relevant part of my presentation to this conference is the discourse of conservation and climate change. Um, so basically, you know how NGOs and government initiatives have these climate mitigation um, strategies and projects that are introduced in different parts of, of the country uh, in order to basically deal with climate change. And one of, one of them is um, the Billion Tree Tsunami, for instance, which is a climate change project which is introduced by the government it, and it has got many international recognition. But this goes against the lifestyle of the local community because their whole livelihood depends on these land, these common areas that have not been planted by the government and they don't have any place to graze their, their cattle in that region. So these regions, they do not need these plants because they already have so many plants, have been made the sacrifice goat, right? Qurbani ka bakra for the government's initiatives like 10 billion tree tsunami. While if you talk about Lahore or Islamabad or Karachi, they would never demolish a building, an industry, and plant trees there as a climate change project. But they see that there is an open land that is being used by these local pastoralist communities, and then they would just plant trees there. And then present this like we planted 10 billion trees in Pakistan, and then give all the, um, get all the credits for it. Um, so basically, <coughs> that idea of conservation is very new liberal. It doesn't align well with the local people. They already have many conservation plans in mind, but they are not taken into consideration by the NGOs and the local government. And obviously there's this whole idea of modernity that you have to develop, you should have cars, you should have good life, and then you should get rid of all these, um, you know, there's, there's this whole phenomenon of connecting goats with flooding, that how goats actually cause flood which is quite a baseless argument in many ways that we'll talk about now. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> so why is climate change such an important topic for us today, especially in relation to this region of Chitral? So outside the polar region, Gilgit, Baldistan and Chitral has the highest concentration of glaciers in the world with a great biodiversity and rich indigenous culture and languages. So I've already given the references if you want to note them. Uh, and then the pastoral livelihood globally are not threatened by anything more than the climate change, right? So when we talk about climate change, when we are critical of climate change here today, it doesn't mean that we, are, we have any propaganda against climate change because climate change affects these people the most. But what we are critical of how the projects are implemented in this region. Um, and then there are various researches by Isimut in Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan, and Afghanistan that have shown that the disappearance of water from their migratory routes have caused in great discomfort for the pastoralists, and that must, they must relocate their settlements and change their routes. So like I'm telling you, there were many routes that already were being used by the pastoralists, but now there is no water, climate change has caused in flooding and other things that have totally changed their lifestyle. So climate change is like really a havoc for these communities. Um, and then there's the neoliberal, hood, ne neoliberal livelihood idea of individual prosperity through hard work and the American dream that I al already talked about that, you know, like this, there's a dis this kind of uh, a wave of climate, climate education which emphasize on an individual person that you should not use plastic, that you should do this and you should do that. That's a new liberal way of doing, dealing with climate change. It doesn't deal with, deal with the system. It deals with one person. It makes you responsible, it blames you, and tells you that you are responsible for climate change without looking at how the fossil fuel industry, without looking at how the big companies are actually destroying our earth, without looking at how uh, government initiatives, how NGO initiatives are actually a threat to the community itself. So this new liberal way of looking at climate change is very destructive for, for these local communities that are already being uh, affected by climate change in so many different ways. Okay, we are coming towards the end and I just wanted to, because to give you uh, an idea of why this change is such important for these local communities, right? Um, so there's a group of people who still consider that their livelihood is is still very much dependent on uh, livestock and cattle because uh, all the rituals, all their death ceremonies, their religious festival, their wedding, their birth ceremony, everything accompanies some kind of cattle. They have to have that in their, in their household. Uh, obviously then there is health concern 
when we buy food from, uh, from outside, I think somebody already discussed uh, microplastics here. So the organic food that they used to produce in combination with the pastoralist life system is changing and it's creating so many uh, health issues for the local people there. Just to give you an example of the feelings of people, how they feel about this change, uh, there is a poetry from uh, a person named Zakir Zakhmi, who is a local poet. I've tried to roughly translate this. And he says that the lambs, calves, and kids, baby goats are gone. The livestock of the house are altogether gone. The beauty and sustenance of a house and its sites are gone. So that's how people feel about this change. They think that their house is no more their house because there is no cattle, because there is no pastoral livelihood. Okay, just to conclude, and just to discuss um, my research, there are a few points I think that we should be mindful of when we are dealing with uh, local communities and pastoral communities. First of all, uh, using a rural political ecology for, for a pastoralist study, it would not only help us understand human nature affiliation, but also to rethink our biases towards such communities, right? There's a bias, uh, a lot of the people in the science, in the governments, in the NGO think, that pastoralist communities are responsible for actually ruining um, you know, the land and for the floods, which is not true as we discussed. And then this study suggests that nature is not an untouched place where the states and NGO inspired by Western conservationist imagine of or rather nature is created and maintained by such pastoralist communities through their daily life interaction. So this again, this whole human nature binary that we see in our world, it's a very Western idea where they say like, if we plant 10 billion tree tsunami here, the community should not engage with it, which wouldn't work, which doesn't work, and which didn't work. Uh, and it's the hard work of pastoralists which help in the maintenance of the biodiversity of the area. Similarly, in opposition to stereotyping of pastoralists as irrational and the cause of environmental degradation, the perspective of local pastoralists and other academic studies now show that grazing is beneficial for mixing the soil and emergence of diverse shrubs and plants. This again goes to um, address this whole discourse against pastoralist communities and their goats. <coughs> and then I think this I already discussed a bit, how the rural areas are made sacrificial goats for 10 billion tree tsunamis. Their issues are different, and the projects that are implemented there are different. The people there need good electricity to meet their fuel needs. They already have so many trees, they would never cut them if they have good electricity for fuel and to protect themselves from cold and to cook. They would never cut the trees that they already have. You're not giving them electricity and then you're just planting trees there, which doesn't benefit them. Rather, it takes the land that you have been using for pastoralism. And then the number of vehicles has increased so much over time in this region. Now, now no, none of the government agencies or the NGOs talk about this. There's a motorcycle in every house, there's a car in every house, which is a lot more harmful for the glaciers that are there than having goats. So instead of just considering these people as backward, we have to step back and look at what their livelihood is and how our modern ideas of development, how our new ideas of neoliberalism are actually affecting this region. Obviously, then there are hundreds of tourists that are coming there, which is a huge threat to the uh, very fragile environment there. But nobody in the government or NGO would criticize that because that produces some kind of money and revenue for this region, which is obviously doesn't go to the local community, but it goes only to the, either the local elites or other institutions and organizations. Um, so I think this is the end of my presentation, although there's a lot more that has to be to say. Um, I'm